it's now my pleasure to introduce the, the Steve Katz International Lectureship and to introduce the lecturer, the first lecturer, Dr. Brian Kemp. So this lecture was to honor Dr. Katz, as I've said, and Dr. Katz, I, we've gone over most of the things or many of the things why we're honoring him. And I won't go over those again here. Um, the endowment for this lectureship is set up to support an annual lecture, not only at the SID, but because of Steve's international influence uh, at the Japanese Society of Investigative Dermatology, the European Society for Dermatologic Research, and the International Society of Investigative Dermatology, because Steve is an, was an internationally respected giant in our field. Now, the current status of the endowment is it has been started mostly by his trainees and mentees and by these dermatologic societies, which I've listed here. Uh, but uh, we got interrupted in fundraising because of COVID. So I'm just going to ask people here, as I was going to ask when it was supposed to start two years ago, if anyone would like to contribute to honor Steve, you just go to the SID website www.sidnet.org and you hover your uh, pointer over donate and you can, there's a link to donate to Steve, Steve's uh, award. I, and I hope many of you will do this. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first Steve Katz International Lecturer who's particularly uh, a good person for this, Dr. Brian Kim, because he was in the lab of Dr. Katz. And he's going to talk about neuroregulation of itch. Let me just give you a little background. I don't want to use up too much more time. Uh, he received his BS from Haverford College, his MD from University of Washington. He was a Howard Hughes Research Scholar at NIH in Steve's lab. He was a dermatology resident and instructor at the University of Pennsylvania. He also received a Master's of Science in Translational Research at University of Pennsylvania. Then he was associate professor at Washington University School of Medicine. And now he has a very long title, which I can't really say what it all is because it uses too much time, but he's a professor of dermatology at Mount Sinai. I hope you'll forgive me for that, uh, Brian. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brian Kim, who will talk about neuroimmune regulation of itch. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, John. It's a, a great honor to be here. Uh, it's a very emotional to hear all these stories from uh, Steve's trainees and friends and colleagues. Um, and it's a real honor to have John Stanley. Uh, I, I, went, I went to UPenn for residency because of John Stanley. To have him uh, introduce me is just uh, uh, is, is a real honor. And of course, thank you to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity. Um, it's not lost upon me, uh, as uh, I'm sure it's very apparent that Steve had many, many uh, accomplished trainees, so it's incredibly humbling for me to be up here uh, and to pay tribute to, to Steve Katz. And um, I also want to highlight uh, kind of an anecdote of how Steve uh, operates and, and the influence he has, as you can already see, that Sherry Meltzer, his assistant of 25 years, actually emailed me a couple months ago, and she said, Brian, I'm so happy that you're uh, giving the Steve Katz lecture. And uh, she said, I'm just so excited. Um, and here I was a medical student in his lab. Um, he said he doesn't take medical students, and he took me. Um, and that Sherry is emailing me after all these years uh, speaks to the fact that he, the interest he took in people uh, resulted in his family, he was growing a family, and that we all take interest in each other. And I think it really speaks to Steve's legacy um, in, a, in a very profound way. Um, here are my uh, disclosures. So you, we heard a lot about Steve. He was born in New York in 1941. Uh, he was a, a very loving and wonderful husband to Linda. And he was an amazing father to uh, Mark, Ken, and Karen. And two, for too brief of a moment, he was actually a uh, grandfather to Ben. And you heard about Bob Katz. Uh, Bob was his brother, a dermatologist, who had actually convinced him to go into dermatology. Uh, Bob was his ultimate mentor. Uh, it's really hard for me to imagine Steve Katz needing a mentor. Uh, 
Uh, he's, I thought he came out of the womb with his eternal wisdom. You know, so it, but yet Bob was his, his mentor and, and um, had a tremendous amount of influence. And as you already heard, he was a mentor and friend to so many people. Um, it's funny, we actually collaborated with Tom Waldman, who's a giant in the cytokine field, uh, uh, really, really famous for IL-15. And he actually, Steve grew up in Bethesda and actually delivered newspapers uh, to Tom Waldman. And I thought that was a really funny story. And here we were collaborating and we actually published a paper together. Um, and uh, Steve grew up in Bethesda. Uh, he actually, something that didn't come up is that he very, uh, was open with the fact that he was not a good student. And I think he did this to tell students, you don't have to always be a good student. You can, you know, uh, and I, I saw him speak to a group of high school kids once. Uh, but he did go to the University of Maryland and excelled, went to Tulane for medical school where he got an honorary degree, uh, LA County Hospital. He went all around. Bob Katzen convinced him to go to the University of Miami for residency in dermatology. And as you heard, um, he was in the military at Walter Reed and uh, got his PhD from the University of London. He was then recruited to the NIH, and we all know that he was a director of NIAMS and really had a profound influence on uh, dermatology. This is his beautiful, wonderful family. I was actually uh, emailing with them the last couple of days leading up to this. Uh, you can see that Steve is wearing the NIAMS shirt. Uh, he was very, very proud of the fact that uh, he, he was a NIH uh, citizen. As you already heard, he was a uh, pioneer in skin immunology. John Stanley mentioned that. And uh, he really honed in on the kind of skin as an immune system, and I'll speak to that. And uh, here's a quote from actually, I think, an interview that John Stanley did with him in, in JAMA Dermatology, where he says, giving of yourself and taking joy in the success of your students. And that is his mantra. And I think we can use the term students very, very liberally here. So a fa I'm going to weave in quotes from Steve. He had an amazing quotes, and he'd love to say, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And I'm, I'm not sure if I still understand, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but this is recapitulation theory where an organism in its stages of development actually recapitulates the embryonic stages of development of its ancestor. But I think it speaks to the fact that Steve had this intense interest in watching his children in the broadest sense grow and develop. And he was always, I would do something and he'd say, ontogeny recapit recapitulates phylogeny. <laughs> and, uh, and he just loved that. And this is just a list of all of his direct trainees. I'm buried there in the middle. I was one of his last trainees in his laboratory. So uh, what were Steve's scientific pursuits? So you heard a bit about it. He was very, I'm gonna focus in on certain aspects of his science. He was very interested in understanding how antigen-presenting cells, or Langerhans cells, in the skin get activated, process antigen, migrate to the lymph node, and really activate the adaptive immune system, or T cells. But he was also very interested in understanding how the epithelium itself actually directly engages the immune system. And I realized that when I was in his laboratory, because this was actually a, a project that I was working on. I was in the lab in 2004, so I was actually digging up papers from the 80s at that time. And he was interested in understanding how keratinocytes themselves actually express MHC class II and may actually directly present antigen uh, to T cells. And this is what we worked on. Um, we actually had developed a mouse in which uh, the antigen could actually be, a model antigen could actually be expressed directly within keratinocytes. And then you can transfer in antigen-specific T cells into the skin, and what you could do is actually elicit uh, a graft-versus-host disease-like process in the skin. And it's just kind of characteristic features with uh, dermal infiltrate, vacuolar change, and um, and what we were studying was how Langerhans cells should regulate this process. And the idea was, the dogma was that these antigen-presenting cells should actually present antigen. And in collaboration with Bjorn Clausen, what we were able to do is get a mouse in which we could actually delete Langerhans cells. So if you look at just a normal mouse, what you'll find are these beautiful cells, NFOS, looking down at the skin, which are Langerhans cells in a normal mouse skin. And then if you transfer in these T cells, you get this GVHD-like disease in the setting in, in, in uh, Langerhans cell-sufficient mice. But what we could actually do is delete these Langerhans cells 
And to our surprise, the disease was uh, processed unabated. And this isn't that surprising now to some degree, but at the time it was rather surprising. And, uh, and this was actually my first, first author paper, and we uh, had identified how uh, keratinocytes can actually function to potentially, in certain contexts, present antigen. Uh, and so the idea was that these T cells could actually get activated uh, by directly engaging uh, epithelial cells. But after leaving Steve's lab, he had a, 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 a huge influence on, on me and, and, and my uh, science and how to think about the skin, and I became increasingly obsessed with how different aspects of the skin can act as the immune system. And the question in my mind was, what else could uh, be going on here? How can the epithelium actually activate the immune system? And the real kind of driving question of our program based on this was how does the skin become inflamed? And then how does this inflammation lead to itch? Something that's so obvious, even to a five-year-old, if you have a rash, it's itchy. But these simple questions had not been asked in a, a systematic fashion uh, in our minds. Um, and I'm gonna talk, so I'm gonna talk about itch a little bit. So how does the skin sense itch? And this is not something that really came to light uh, until very recently. Itch was considered a mild form of pain a trivial sensation, patients are crazy. This is not something that really needs to be studied. That, that was the prevailing paradigm. And, and even for me, uh, I'm not a nurse trained neuroscientist, what I knew about the peripheral nervous system was derived much more from my experience as a physician. The autonomic nervous system, which in an efferent fashion, regulates processes like breathing, heart rate, and even in the skin, the autonomic nervous system is important. It regulates processes like sweating, and vasomotor tone. But it's still not something that we really think about a lot as, a, as dermatologists. But we, we do have to think about the somatosensory nervous system. The somatosensory nervous system is an incredibly complex system that was designed essentially for the skin to sense the outside world. You have different nerve fibers that can even sense your hair shaft moving. You can sense different forms of mechanical stimulation and pain. And it, what I'm going to talk about mostly are these unmyelinated C fibers, um, which can sense things like temperature, as well as heat, cold, pain, and a small subset can actually mediate itch. The whole right side actually has really a spotlight has been uh, put on it in the fall because of the Nobel Prizes for Somatic Sensation, David Julius for uh, the Sensation of Temperature and uh, um, Artem Patipudian for the uh, sensation of touch. Uh, and I think this is putting a bit more of a spotlight on itch as well. So I mentioned that itch is overlooked, but why suddenly are we taking itch much more seriously? Well, in my opinion, it really starts from the science. So people were trying to figure out, is itch really a truly distinct sensation? And the real science came in the last 10 years or so where itch-inducing molecules or pyridogens were identified to activate unique circuits by way of receptors, such as mass-related G-protein-coupled receptors uh, in the peripheral sensory neurons, uh, discovered by Shenzong Dong at Hopkins, uh, a close collaborator. Um, Mark Hoon discovered that brain natriuretic peptide is a neuropeptide that's released from these peripheral neurons, dumps into the spinal cord, and activates itch. And then Jufeng Chen discovered that gastrin-releasing peptide receptor marks itch-specific neurons within the spinal cord and then the first author from that original landmark paper, Yang Gang Sun, discovered recently that there are foci within the brain that receive these signals. This is not to snow you in with a bunch of neuroscience, but I think it's really this kind of uh, seminal discover these discoveries that really led us to believe that itch is actually tractable, it's a real thing, and that this is not just a pain circuit, this is truly an itch circuit. And I will drive that theme, hopefully, throughout. So Steve one time said to me, he said, there's no problem that cannot be solved. And I kind of looked at him, kind of, yeah, no, there's some. And he said, no, listen to me, Brian. And he looked at me now, he said, there's no problem that cannot be solved. And that was not a literal thing, but it was a spiritual thing that I carried with me forever. And uh, it, it really told me what a force of nature this guy really is, that this is how he views the world. And, uh, so we, I decided, okay, we'll solve, try to solve the problem of eczema, which at that time was considered somewhat unsolvable. So that was a disease we decided to go after. 
what was known about it at that time was a bit of a T-cell centric world, a bit of an antigen specific uh, world that there are stimuli or allergens in the environment that translocate, translocate across the barrier, activate these T-cells somewhat mysteriously, and you get production of these TH2 cytokines that then uh, activate the production of IgE, a hallmark feature of atopic disorders, and these cytokines directly damage the barrier. And again, going back to Steve's thing, what does the epidermis do? What does the brick and mortar of the skin really have to do with this? And, the fir and I was thinking about this, and, thinking, and the first clues came by with these epithelial cell-derived cytokines, or alarming cytokines that alarm the immune system. They actually come out, IL-33 and TSLP, are expressed from the stress barrier. And it was already starting to emerge during my postdoc that these cytokines actually potently activate this pathway. And when we looked downstream of these cytokines, we came to appreciate that there were cells such as rare basophils in circulation that come in and are major sources of IL-4. And at that time, entirely uh, undiscovered cells, group two and eight lymphoid cells, uh, or ILC2s in the skin are present and uh, embryo em embryologically actually seeded into the skin and are major sources of IL-5 and 13. And this started to shift the paradigm to en encompass these innate cell populations that actually, through these cytokines, in a way, sense the world. So this is where we were already starting to think of things uh, in, in neuroscientific terms. And in fact, when I started my laboratory, uh, one of the key things we started to appreciate it was that these canonical type two cytokines that we had completely thought of just being within the immune system actually were communicating with the sensory nervous system. And this was very important uh, to us because this really hinted that perhaps these cytokines are actually directly involved, not indirectly, but rather very directly involved, and maybe even acting as neurotransmitters in the setting of itch. And this is just kind of a, uh, an oldie but goodie now, but this is my first graduate student, Landon Etchen, MD, PhD student. The way he approached this was he simply took sensory neurons, or dorsal root ganglia, uh, from both mice and through collaboration, cadaveric human donors, and just looked for expression of these canonical type 2 cytokine receptors. And he's able to dis detect IL-4 receptor alpha, IL-13 receptor alpha-1, and at that time we already knew that IL-31 was emerging to be a true cytokine peritogen. So we, as a control, we were looking for the IL-31 receptor. And what, one of the things that we noticed right away was, was that this was highly conserved between both mice and humans. And that is, in fact, uh, a, a feature of type 2 immunity and itch, we think. It's a very conserved uh, kind of response. The question is that these sensory neurons do express these receptors, but do, does that mean anything? Does it really do anything? Is this an epiphenomenon? So to test this, we do calcium imaging, where we simply put DRG neurons into the dish, label them with dye, so then we can detect calcium influx into the cell, and then look to see functionally do these uh, neurons actually respond, and in fact, they do. We can ask, actually also confirm the identity of these neurons. We find that these, uh, for example, this neuron responds to capsaicin. Capsaicin activates TRPV1, which is, a, which is a cation channel that is essentially marks what we call nociceptive or sensory neurons, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to show this data, but what we were able to tease out is that this kind of neuroimmune axis of how these cytokines interact with the sensory nervous system is a critically important uh, process by which these cytokines either activate or sensitize neurons to a variety of other signals and make you very sensitive to uh, a whole host of signals and perhaps what drives itch. It's also why we think uh, that drugs like dupilumab or other cytokine blockers can actually disrupt itch in ways that we have not seen before with uh, prior therapeutics. But the other thing that we started to notice was that neuroscientists who had somewhat of an indifference towards itch were discovering through single cell RNA sequencing that these, that there are itch specific neurons that were code, you could codify based on historical functional work that had laid the foundation. So you could see these blue, green, or red neurons that are itch specific. And one of the things that we observed was that actually, although specific for this itch cluster, that the receptors for these type 2 cytokines were read rather broadly expressed across these different subsets. And why get into this kind of science? Well, it actually provoked a hypothesis already at that time that maybe this has much more to do with just atopic dermatitis. Maybe conditions that are inherently itchy, primarily neurogenic, uh, 
So uh, an itch drives the formation of hyperkeratotic nodules, perigonodularis being the condition. Maybe even in that condition, drugs like dupilumab would actually be effective. And we pressed this point, even though being a basic science lab, really pressed this point and actually uh, submitted an investigator initiated trial proposal to Regeneron to try to accelerate this process. And we went back and forth. And what happened was that they decided they're just going to jump straight ahead to phase three. And at that point, I said, we don't need any funding for this trial. <laughs> uh, this is great for our patients. And in fact, these results came out in the fall. Uh, Dupilva met key primary and secondary endpoints, and I think we'll see this uh, drug approved here very soon. But we've treated other patients with idiopathic paritis. These are individuals who have scratch marks where they can reach, uh, clear skin where they can't. And off-label, we found that anecdotally, these patients do quite well, especially individuals with very severe itch uh, from our clinic. And we feel that this also des deserves uh, a randomized trial investigation. But at the time, as we were discovering how these cytokines act on the nerve, we also knew that they had to signal through downstream signaling pathways like Jack signaling, Janus kinase signaling. And in fact, if you go back to the single cell RNA sequencing, you find that in fact, within the pruroceptor itch neurons, you see high enrichment for Jack one in particular. And in recent studies, in fact, this is confirmed in humans. Jack one actually lights up a very distinct cluster of human uh, itch specific neurons at the single cell level as well. So again, uh, highly conserved. But we were able to predict then that perhaps if we can choke off cytokines that we don't e haven't even discovered or mapped out what they do, you know, spend a whole R1 cycle trying to figure out what one cytokine does, uh, we could just jump ahead and go, go into these uh, JAK pathways, and there were drugs already available that we could uh, perhaps use uh, to, to really figure out if this really works. And we, we felt that this kind of activity by using JAK inhibitors would result in rapid, potent, and broad anti-itch activity. And in fact, this is what we've seen in phase three trials now with abracitinib, which is now approved for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, apatacitinib, a JAK1 selective inhibitor as well. And we played a hand in this as well. We, again, uh, instigated uh, the um, uh, pivotal phase two trials for topical ruxolitinib, which is now approved. And you can get it. It was actually the first JAK inhibitor approved for uh, uh, in, in dermatology. And we've used JAK inhibitors we could get our hands on in patients with idiopathic pruritus. These are patients that are suffering dearly. This is mostly what I see in the clinic. They've seen six, seven dermatologists come in from all over the country. And anecdotally, we found that these patients can do well as well. And we feel that randomized trials are certainly warranted. And um, uh, we would love to see that happen. But this is to highlight the therapeutic landscape uh, and the development landscape is just incredibly vast. And, uh, and the itch efficacy of these pathways has really uh, proven their worth. And we think that beyond the anti-inflammatory paradigm, there is a truly bona fide neuromodulatory paradigm that we can actually uh, take advantage of. And in, in recently, uh, Fang Wang, uh, a postdoctoral fellow who's now uh, uh, vice director of our department at the first affiliated hospital and full professor, identified that also, even in atopic dermatitis, if we go back to it, uh, the chronic inflammation in atopic dermatitis results in activation of basophils that activates an alternative immunologic circuit that actually underlies the acute itch flares, we think, in atopic dermatitis and activates a unique itch pathway by way of leukotriene C4, non-histaminergic. And what's emerging is that a lot of these itch pathways at the neuroimmune interface actually converge upon many of the same neurons, and these represent both molecular and cellular targets for therapy in the future. And what's interesting about itch is I, I mentioned it's very overlooked. It, it was probably one of the most un underfunded areas, uh, yet the translational success is, is uh, quite striking. The, in other words, the return on investment for this field has just been amazing, and we're starting to see how really big of a problem this is. So sometimes the solution reveals how big of the, the problem actually really was. But the other interesting thing is people are finding, again, the neuroscientists are finding that there are itch-specific neurons even within the vagus nerve, which innervates the viscera, the heart, the lung, and the gut. Why would you itch in those areas? You don't. And, um, and what's interesting is that these they're not really looking for these nerves, and they have the same molecular machinery. And, um, and so what's going on here? And so we verified this as well. Masato Tamari, a very talented postdoctoral fellow, looked at TRIP-V1 expression, the, the, the sensor cation channel, uh, 
And if I blinded you to the vagal ganglia and the dorsal root ganglia, you would think you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. In fact, 80% of the, the vagus nerve is actually sensory, something I did not realize until recently. And in fact, what I've been talking about to, uh, entirely is these somatic afferents, you know, the, the, the nerves in the skin that mediate itch, but we don't even know what these spinal visceral afferents, which also innervate the viscera, do. It's a complete mystery. I mean, this is an absolute frontier. The vagus nerve is a sensory nerve, very little known. And so what we actually think is that itch represents actually a paradigm of irritation. Um, and in fact, if you look at this paper from Neuron, in the context of migraine, if you look in the trigeminal ganglia, this is the itch nerve. If you go from mouse to human, you see increased expression of neuropeptide, CGRP. So why neuropeptide? Well, we think is, yes, cytokines can hit the nerve and cause all matter of sensory dysfunction and you might get itch, but these nerves actually have the machinery to release neuropeptides and influence the scope and intensity of inflammation. And in fact, individuals here, Nicole Ward, Dan Kaplan, others like Uli von Andrian, Isaac Chu, have really been in this space, how the neurons actually regulate inflammation. So the idea that just itch or pain of a hot nerve can cause is a truly inflammatory state is an emerging paradigm. So what we think is itch is probably the tip of a sensory iceberg. The molecular and cellular, cellular machinery of itch might actually even better represent a lot of these irritable conditions. We talked about pain uh, uh, earlier. It may be that even pain is not the right description. So the science may actually indicate that itch is a better uh, paradigm to approach a lot of these conditions that are all unmet, lacking therapies, uh, and a huge, huge areas within medicine. So we started with Steve, what causes a rash, GVHD, uh, went into unexpectedly into neuroimmunology, which we've able to then help accelerate and inform therapeutic developments, clinical trials, new FDA approved drugs, but then also reverse translate this and to identify new forms of itch, and also perhaps revise sensory paradigms to think about things differently, well beyond the skin as well. I wanna thank the individuals who did the work. Uh, uh, many of them are the former members that I highlighted. Uh, we have a very growing lab at Mount Sinai in New York. Our wonderful collaborators. I really want to highlight NIAMS uh, as the director is here. <laughs> We've made good on our promise. Um, and then, um, and then uh, Emma Gutman, who recruited me to Mount Sinai, who's just absolutely building a fantastic department. Please join us. Um, and uh, lastly, I want to highlight, uh, this was back in 2005 with Steve, and then later he came to visit me when I was at WashU, uh, building up the lab, and it was just, uh, and he was with my students, and it was such a great time. And uh, I think these pictures do represent how he really does build family. Yeah, I trained with Steve, and you, he mentored John Stanley, and you have Amy Payne here who trained with John Stanley. And here we are together, um, all taking deep interest in each other uh, for years to come. So thank you very much. It's a true honor to be presenting uh, in tribute to Steve. Thank you very much. And that was a wonderful talk. I, can, I think I can say without any doubt that Steve would have been so proud of you. Uh, you've done such a fantastic job in opening a new field and an innovative field. And in that, we will end our session. Thank you very much all for attending.